chair of the Student Philanthropy Council here at DePaul, um, and I'm here to introduce Professor Dewey. A specialist in modern British history, Professor Dewey completed his MPhil and DPhil degrees at Oxford University and, and was subsequently awarded a postdoctoral research fellowship funded by the European Commission at Syracuse University's Maxwell School. school. He joined the DePauw faculty, faculty in 2004 and teaches history courses on Britain, the British Empire, modern Europe, and the Pacific Islands. His book, his first book, The Anti-Marketeers, charter charted the ideological and nationalist origins of the Eurosceptic phenomenon in the early 1960s. On the basis of that research, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in Britain in 2009. Since then, Professor Dewey has pursued research projects on British imperial sport and the growth of rugby football in the Pacific Islands. His current book project analyzes rugby in Fiji during the colonial period from 1874 to 1970. He has also researched rugby's embrace of professionalism in, the in 1995 and its impact on the sport in the Pacific. He has published, published six articles and book chapters on these topics and presented his findings to audiences in Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, New Zealand, Australia, and the United Kingdom. He also served as historical consultant to Fiji Rugby and helped organize events including two international conferences in honor of the Fiji Rugby Centennial in 1913. As part of the Alumni Engagement Virtual Alumni College Series, please welcome Dr. Robert Dewey. Thank you very much and hello to everyone out there, in particular the group in Los Angeles that has gathered for a Brexit dinner. Um, and I hope nationalist politics doesn't upset your appetites in any way. Um, there's one other introduction I need to do here, uh, and that is of uh, a senior student at DePauw, Jackson Whiting, um, from Darien, Connecticut. Uh, Jackson did his senior thesis this year on the UK Independence Party, and he did an excellent job of it, and he knows more about UKIP probably than anyone else on campus, and so I felt free to draft him in to talk about that when we get to that stage of the, of the proceedings. So he will appear here um, in about 15 minutes or so. Uh, but first, just to get to the, the title of the talk here, Fog and Channel, Continent Cut Off, um, I've put that in quotation marks because that refers to what is possibly the most famous headline in British history. And it refers to the idea that there is fog in the channel and that therefore continental Europe has been cut off from Britain, the left ventricle of the universe. Now there's only one problem with this fog and channel um, quote that gets repeated all the time, which is that it never actually happened. It's variously attributed to the Daily Mail in the 1930s or the Times in the 1950s, but no one has actually been able to find the first appearance of this. So for 2016, where everything seems a little bit fake news-wise, uh, this seems to be a perfectly appropriate metaphor for what's going on. As, as, and as I said, it gets quoted uh, frequently in discussions of the recent Brexit result. So as for the result itself, on June the 23rd, more than 30 million UK citizens, a turnout of 72%, voted in a referendum on whether Britain should remain a member of the European Union. The so-called Brexit referendum resulted in a 52 to 48% victory for Leave campaigners, the so-called Eurosceptics. Um, and they had peddled a populist anti-European and anti-immigrant message to British voters. Having filed for the divorce, uh, Britain now is scheduled to undertake negotiations to break from this organization it has been part of since 1973. Now, many of you will recall the short-term impact of this because US journalists started parachuting into Britain to discuss the sensational results. Um, we had shockwaves in the international trading markets, the pound sterling tumbling to a 40-year low. The conservative prime minister, David Cameron, who was here in December, uh, resigned uh, because he had been on the Remain side of the equation. Half of the opposition Labour Party shadow cabinet resigned uh, in protest at the leadership of their, uh, their leader, Jeremy Corbyn. The next day, the two most prominent members of the Leave campaign admitted that a good part of their um, appeal was actually based on fraudulent statistics and that, in fact, they had no plan for what would happen to Britain after Britain went out. The more thoughtful corners of the press panicked. The pundit punditry established was firmly routed. The Leave section of the country celebrated what it called Independence Day. Some in the shocked Remain campaign spoke of the breakup of Britain, possibly the breakup of the EU itself. 
and a particularly curious subgroup of, we'll call them buyer's remorse people, with faces firmly planted in their hands, decided that maybe they had voted the wrong way. Since then, things have become a little bit clearer, although I should make one thing clear. Um, the Brexit referendum did not take Britain out of the European Union. That process is only just about to begin and will begin at the end of, end of this month. So we had the referendum. The actual negotiations for this to happen are about, are about to begin. So there are four questions uh, for today. First of all, how did we get here? That's probably the easiest one. The second, who were the big political winners and losers? That one's fairly easy as well. And then the hard ones. How do we explain the result? And finally, what does the future hold? Um, and as a historian, I'm very on really dicey ground when it comes to predictions. But insofar as there's a thesis in all this, I would offer you the following. That what happened on June the 23rd was less a fog and channel moment than a potent perfect storm whose winds had blown hard for years a gale force mixture of economic, cultural, regional, and generational division, political ineptitude, opportunism, and malaise, globalization, and creaky international institutions, legitimate debates about sovereignty mixed with hysteria, and above all, a centuries-old British identity that was constructed in opposition to a European other. So before going any farther into the details of this, I think that we should probably get our heads around what these two entities are to begin with, the UK and the EU. Um, we're going to call these thing one and thing two, and these are very complicated parts of the world. First of all, what is the UK? Variously known as Britain or Britannia to the Romans, uh, the United Kingdom, Albion to the Celts, perfidious Albion to the French, and England by American tourists in Leicester Square, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland comprises four national members, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, each with regional assemblies. It has a population of 65 million people. It's the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, and it's a proud, independent place, having not been invaded since 1066. The UK has a two-tier legislature or parliament whose upper house, the House of Lords, is unelected. It has an official church that no one really attends anymore. It has a head of state who's held that position for 64 years and whose coat of arms, as John Oliver is fond of pointing out, includes a unicorn. Oh, and it once controlled a quarter of the globe. In short, if you want my definition of what the UK is, and you won't find this in the Oxford English Dictionary, but nonetheless, the UK is a post-imperial, post-industrial, asymmetrically semi-devolved economic and political union governed by a limited symbolic monarchy and an unwritten constitution. So if that's complicated enough for you, we'll move on to thing two, which is actually even more complicated. So what is the European Union? And I've got a map there for you of the member states. The EU is a unique form of supranationalism. It's not a country. It's not a nation state. It's not a mere government. It's not a mere international organization. It's more than a trading bloc, but less than a federal union. It is a largely confederal political and economic unit with federalist tendencies comprised of 28 member states. Its ambitions are at least to complete a unified single market for Europe, and for its great dreamers, they would like to create a United States of Europe. That one seems increasingly distant. The EU has 24 official languages. Its executive, the European Commission, is appointed rather than directly elected. It has a co-decision legislative process that is so opaque and complicated most Europeans don't understand it. It has a single currency, but only 19 member states use it. It does not have a president. It does not have a head of state. It does not have a constitution. But it does have a flag, and it does have an anthem, but the anthem has no lyrics. The UK, thing one, has been a member of the European Union, thing two, or the European community as it was called then, since 1973. So the next question then becomes, well, how did we, how did we get here in the first place? And if you remember nothing about the EU when you leave this talk, there are one or two things you need to know. The first is that what became the European Union was created with one ambition in mind, and that was to prevent World War III. And on that score, it has been enormously successful, so successful that we simply take it for granted. It was a matter of using economic means to get to a political end, and that political end was that we not have another world war in Europe. So the EEC was founded in 1958 by the Treaty of Rome. Uh, 
The six original members were France, Germany, Italy, and the Benelux countries. The British decided not to sign that treaty because they disliked the supranational aspects of it and were very distrustful of federalism. But with the British Empire fading and fading fast in the 1950s, the writing was on the wall that economic prosperity, if one was going to have it, was going to be in Europe rather than trading in the empire. And so in 1961 and 1967, the British applied for membership of what was then called the EEC. On both occasions, they were rejected uh, single-handedly by the French President Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle left power in 1969, the British reapplied in 1973, and now Britain is in. And so here's our headline from The Guardian, we're in but without the fireworks, which really captures it pretty well. Because two things had happened in 1973. The first was the OPEC oil uh, embargo and the economic downcline, which meant this was a bad time to join economically. And it was also a point at which the European community was deciding it would pursue integration on a much deeper level than it had previously. In other words, what started out as a customs union in Europe was now starting to look like a more federal project. Britain had joined at the most inopportune time, especially for its domestic audience. And so, not surprisingly, perhaps, two years after entering the EEC, um, or the European community, Britain had a referendum on whether they ought to remain in the EEC. That one passed in favor of remaining, 67% to, 30, uh, to 33%. Later in the 1970s, Margaret Thatcher was elected prime minister, and pounding Europe became one of her favorite sports. So Britain which already had an awkward reputation, reputation in Europe became increasingly awkward over time. The Maastricht Treaty creating the EU was signed in 1993, paving the way for more members and a single market as well. And then in 2013, British Prime Minister David Cameron promised a fractious conservative party that they could have a referendum, a straight in or out vote on whether they should remain in Europe sometime before 2017. In the meantime, the Greek economy melted down. New entrant countries like Romania and Bulgaria and recent entries like Poland had huge numbers of people on the move. And so Britain and Europe were all of a sudden looking at a migration crisis and a financial crisis and all of this before we even had the complicated events in Syria. So in 2016, we had the referendum held under those circumstances. And the result created what we might have described as a class of political winners and political losers. We'll start with the losers, including Prime Minister David Cameron, who was here in December, and to his credit, owned the result um, and described it as democracy in action. But he had put this measure forward in the first place. He had to own the result. He had supported remaining in. Um, and when it went the other way, it was time for him to step down as Prime Minister. The other political loser, although it's hard to describe him fully in those terms, is Boris Johnson at the, at the bottom. Most Americans will know him as the guy with the strange hair, and that is, in fact, a cultivated look. Um, oftentimes, before he speaks to the press, if it's not messy enough, he'll run his hands through it. So it's a sort of you know, um, shabby chic or shabby elite chic, whatever you want to call it. Boris Johnson had been pri or rather mayor of London. Um, he was also a British journalist based in Brussels and was fond of writing oftentimes wildly inaccurate uh, articles about the European Union. Um, he also had great political ambitions, which begs the question, how do you know a man wants to become prime minister of Great Britain? And there are two answers to, this, to that. The first is he says he doesn't want to be prime minister of Great Britain. And the second is that you write a biography of Winston Churchill. And so Boris Johnson wrote a biography of Churchill, which is so self-serving I can't possibly recommend it to anybody in the audience, um, its premise was that Churchill is in danger of being forgotten, uh, that his, achievement, his achievements are quickly fading. Um, if anything, the opposite is true, and Britain is, is too bound to this notion of Churchillian, Churchillian greatness. The other lesson that Boris Johnson didn't learn is that if you stab a knife in the back of the prime minister, which he did as a fellow conservative, you don't get to have the top prize. And for more on that, Google a guy named Michael Heseltine because he's the one who did that to Margaret Thatcher, and it didn't work out for him. As for Boris, he became Foreign Secretary, which is a pretty good consolation prize, and still leaves open the possibility of eventually becoming a Prime Minister. As for the winners, Theresa May was standing at the front of the queue when the smoke finally cleared, 
And so her moment had arrived. And then the other fellow, who certainly belongs in the winner's category, is a guy named Nigel Farage. And at this point, I will let Jackson Whiting talk to you a bit about him. Hello, everybody. I'm Jackson Whiting. I'm a senior, and I wrote my senior seminar on the United Kingdom Independence Party. And pictured above is Nigel Farage, who uh, was the former leader of UKIP and is now back in the fray. But a little background on the United Kingdom Independence Party. It was founded in 1991 as the Anti-Federalist League uh, by Dr. Alan Shedd um, as a means to protest uh, the impending Matras Treaty which uh, Professor Dewey alluded to, that was signed in 1993, which deepened the integration of the European Union. But few picked up on this historic, historical illusion, uh, which was after the anti-corn leagues of the 1840s, and so we quickly changed the name to United Kingdom Independence Party, uh, so now voters can understand the main objective, which was the United Kingdom's independence from the European Union. The party, you know, was not politically successful for a long time until Nigel Farage took over in 2006. This coincided with David Cameron's election as a conservative prime minister, or as the leader of the conservative party in 2005. As Cameron moved the conservative party, party towards more socially liberal agendas, that left a vacuum in the conservative uh, realm of politics. And this was taken up by the United Kingdom Independence Party, and especially Nigel Farage, who moved UKIP towards more populist rhetoric than before. In its founding, it was a moderate, single-party issue. Its main objective was to get the United Kingdom Independence Party out, or was to get the United Kingdom out of the European Union. However, as time went on, they weren't politically relevant, and they needed something, they needed something to make them relevant. And they did this through uh, using immigration and other populist divisive rhetoric to make themselves popular. And at the, in its beginning, they claimed the party was a moderate, um, was a, they, voters will have a democratic, non-racist, non-secretarian party to support. And further, UKIP cannot repeat too often that it totally rejects racist views and behavior and desires that all British citizens, whatever their origin, should live in harmony. Next above is a poster um, that was unveiled during the campaign for Brexit, titled The Breaking Point. And it pictured is Nigel Farage in front of what looks to be um, a mass of Syrian refugees or any kind of migrants heading towards Britain. And below it says, the EU has failed us. So campaign tactics like this were very successful for UKIP using the kind of migration crisis that Professor Dewey talked about in Europe to kind of scare off voters into voting the EU, to, for voting for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. And what kind of brought about this change for this party? Um, they only have one member in parliament. And that's important to note that they are not politically powerful in Britain, they don't pass any laws, but what they're really powerful at is enhancing a message. And their message was that we need to leave the EU because we're British. There's something special about Britain. And immigration was their number one tactic to do this. The immigration is ruining Britain. It's having a detrimental effect to Great Britain. And I don't think they get enough credit you kept because they're kind of written off by a lot of the Leave campaigners as kind of this fringe party. No one really wants to talk about them because of their divisive rhetoric. But in the end of the day, they were the backbone behind a lot of this vote. They brought, uh, as, a prof as a historian professor said, we've got a, quite a bit of evidence to suggest that prior to the referendum, the radical right in Britain was an important part of this broader story, which happened. And what they linked is that UKIP's support during the European parliamentary elections in 2014, two years before the Brexit vote, they, those same areas also backed the Leave campaign during the EU referendum. So there was something behind this message, this populist message that UKIP was conveying during the campaign. We've seen it with Donald Trump in the United States. We see it with Marie Le Pen in France. This message 
it goes a long way to a lot of the disenfranchised people that feel they've been left behind by this two-party system, especially in Britain. They felt that Labour and the Conservative parties weren't meeting their needs. So UKIP filled as a vacuum. Um, and they filled in and they campaigned heavily to leave the European Union because Britain would be better without it. Um, and that's the background on UKIP during Brexit. Okay, thank you, Jackson. Um, that was a very famous poster or photo here of, of uh, the UKIP leader in front of the sort of massed ranks of, of migrants. Um, and that gets us to sort of the, the result and how we go about explaining how this happened. There are really two um, sort of popular theories about these and these uh, about this, and they gravitate a, a, around two particular themes. Uh, the first is what we might call the slow growth thesis. This is the economic explanation that says economic conditions uh, in many parts of Britain had stagnated since the mid-1990s and that this is a protest vote against that. There is also something we might describe as the values thesis or the cultural divide thesis, which says that this was a protest against political cultural elites and especially immigration among people who were seeking to turn back the clock. As you might imagine, neither of those explanations is sufficient, although there are elements in both that I think are worth uh, paying attention here to. So the first of those, anti-immigrant feeling. Unemployment in Britain at the time of the uh, referendum was running at 5%. Um, most leaders in Europe would have killed to have 5% unemployment, uh, but Britain had it and nonetheless had a deep and divisive debate about uh, immigration and what that meant for jobs in the economy in Britain. Um, what is surprising about this is how this kind of played itself out in exit polls. And as we start to do the demographics of this, things, a few things begin to become clear. One is that the protests about immigration were most strident in places where the fewest immigrants were actually in place. Um, in other words, in places where there were few immigrants, a few migrants turning up actually looked like a flood to people who, live, who lived there. And this was confirmed by a study in The Economist uh, that showed that in Britain, in places where the foreign-born population grew by 200 percent between 2001 and 2014. A leave vote resulted in 94 percent of the cases. So this was not London protesting against migrants. This was other parts of the country which were not used to seeing people from overseas amongst their ranks. As for the values thesis and the cultural divide, I think there was definitely something in this, and that is also borne out in the, in the exit polling here. Amongst those who wanted to remain, uh, the polls showed that a majority of them um, favored things like feminism, multiculturalism, immigration, and globalization. They saw those things as forces for good. Amongst those who wanted to leave, three quarters saw social liberalism, feminism, <coughs> multiculturalism, and globalization as bad things. This becomes even more explicit, I think, if we look at the age differential on this as well. Um, among young people, the desire to remain was quite strong. Uh, they supported it uh, at, a, at a rate of 73%. But if we start going up the age chart here, by the time we get to 65 and above, 60% of people wanted to leave uh, the European Union. So one of the things that happened here was that millennials were largely enthusiastic about the EU but didn't really bother to turn out to vote. And as a result, the older generation had its, had its say, say here. But there's also a lot more going on here that needs to be accounted for in any explanation of this. The weakness of the Labor Party also needs to be accounted here. Its leader, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, could barely rouse himself to take a remain position um, in this, um, and much of his party would have, would have preferred that he do so. The Leave campaign, and we just saw the, the UKIP leader, uh, lied fairly grotesquely, arguing in one instance that Britain sent 350 million pounds a month to the EU they were off by at least 150 pounds in that estimate, and that that money could simply be redeployed to the National Health Service, which is also untrue. It's also the case that Margaret Thatcher's fingerprints are all over this thing, um, and strangely enough, on both sides of it. On the one hand, Thatcher was a strident Eurosceptic and pounded Europe for domestic reasons and international ones as well. And yet, she signed the Single European Act in 1987, which helped pave the way for the eventual adoption of the, of the single currency. The far right has also needs to be accounted for here, as it has elsewhere in Europe. Uh, the right made its move towards the center, 
To give you one example, the British National Party is led by a guy named Nick Griffin. Um, the BNP seems to have done away with the skinhead um, haircuts, uh, the Doc Martin boots and the drainpipe jeans, and Nick Griffin wears a tie and a jacket and he reads books and things like that. So they have gone for respectability in the same way that the National Front has in France. The Remain campaign, those who wanted to reign, remain with Europe, ran a completely uninspired and anemic campaign in support of their cause. But then the EU has always done a very poor job of actually advocating for itself. As for the EU, it has in recent decades utterly failed, failed to deal with issues of international significance, especially things like migration, um, defense, and finance. And then finally, we have the British press which is an utterly unique institution. There's nothing in America quite like this. Uh, there are multiple national newspapers all competing for audiences. And if you proclaim yourself a national newspaper with Britain's interests at heart, it becomes very easy and very convenient to pound the Europeans on whatever the issue of the day happens to be. So for the better part of 60 years, the hard Eurosceptical press has hammered on the EU in varying shades of truth and untruth. Um, and this would include newspapers like the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, and then the Murdoch Press, the Times and the Sun. Um, the formula for Fox News did not just appear uh, when Murdoch came to America. This had been pioneered in the newspapers in London uh, beforehand. This meant that the Leave campaign could tell fairly substantial lies and get away with it because people were predisposed uh, to believe it, uh, thinking the European other as alternately threatening or inept um, or a feat. So what does all this add up to, at least in terms of an explanation for what happened? And, and there are a lot of other reasons we could add to it. In this kind of atmosphere, should the UK remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union as a question, is recast. So the remain is the status quo and leave is dynamism. More importantly, this gets at the referendum process itself. There were no doubt many people who chose to leave who might have preferred a reformed European Union, but that wasn't on the ballot, and they probably shaded toward the leave side rather than, rather than to stay, just sort of throw the dice uh, as it were. So where does that leave us back with our fog and channel uh, metaphor here? As I said before, the problem with prognosticating on this is that Britain isn't actually out, and what it means to go out is not entirely clear because no one's done it before. Actually, that's not true. Greenland went out, um, I think, in 1985, two years after going in. But they have a population of 55,000. This is an altogether different scenario. So on March the 20th, 29th, the negotiations for exit are supposed to begin. If you had asked me to predict what would happen last autumn, I would have said that Britain and the Europeans would have fudged this somehow, that we would have gotten a fairly decent economic deal out of it, that Britain would have some sort of tier associational status kind of like Norway, so a sort of brand, a friends with a few benefits scenario here. But there's a fundamental problem, and that is that the UK wants access to the truly single European market, but it doesn't want the free movement of labor and people. And you can't have one without the other, and the Europeans are not going to give them that. The second thing is that the EU may not be in a mood to make a deal after all this. Uh, and so it wouldn't be surprising if they took a very hard approach in their negotiations with with the British. The other thing that's going to factor in on this is Britain's cabinet at the moment. It is split between what we might call hard Brexiteers and soft Brexiteers, people who want a, a, a perhaps lighter negotiation and deal for Britain that keeps some closeness to, to Europe. The hard Brexiteers in the British cabinet are in key positions, and they are real headbangers. Uh, David Davis, the Brexit minister, Boris Johnson, the foreign secretary, Liam Fox, the Trade Secretary, are all talking tough about what they're going to say to Angela Merkel and the Europeans. Um, and a lot of that sounds farcical, really. This is a matter of, of the hard Brexiteers trying to prove who's the hardest Brexiteer of them all. The government, in the meantime, is promising a deal that won't hurt the British economy, which also seems highly unlikely. There will be two years for this negotiation to take place. If it's not done after two years, all deals are off the table and Britain is out. To make this happen, British officials have to review 80,000 pages of European Union agreements and decide which of them they're going to keep, which are going to change. That's not going to happen in a two-year period. 
As for other implications and alternatives, there is the breakup of Britain scenario that has emerged from all this. The Scots have made it very clear that they are likely to have a referendum sometime before the next British general election campaign, in fact, perhaps as early as two years from now. There is also the issue of Ireland's relations with Northern Ireland, which have always been complicated and never really went away, despite the Good Friday Agreement. There is the question of other EU departures as well. Ital exit, if Italy goes out, the EU survives that one. If we get Frexit and the French go out, that's it. The game is, uh, the game is over. And then there's the question of, well, what's, what's the alternative here? And there are some extraordinary ideas being peddled in this realm, including something called Empire 2.0 which imagines, remarkably, that the Commonwealth countries of the, foreign empire, of the British Empire are somehow going to be encouraged to start trading again with Britain on preferential terms. Um, and this is farcical, and it's a total misreading of recent imperial history, and it shouldn't really be taken seriously. There's other, also something called the Anglosphere, or Kanzuk, in which Canada, the, U, uh, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand will somehow form this Anglo trading zone. This dream is at least 100, 150 years old, and it has never come to pass in any sort of significant way. If you're Australia or New Zealand, your trading interests are in Asia, with China and Japan and Korea, not with Britain. And as for Canada, it's already in NAFTA, and it has a, what, a 1,500 or 2,000 mile border with the United States as well. And it also seems unlikely to sort of come back and embrace Britain as this wonderful trade partner. So this yearning for Empire 2.0 is rather absurd. It, Timothy Garton Ash, who sort of talked about some of this stuff in the press, said it's the equivalent of saying, let's make Carthage great again. It's just not going to happen. So what we're left with is, is explanations that are complicated and not entirely satisfactory, but an atmosphere that looks awfully familiar to us. And so if you're interested in this, I can commend to you a new novel by Ali Smith entitled Autumn. It's being touted as the first post-Brexit novel. Um, who knew there was going to be a subgenre called post-Brexit, but apparently the, there is. Um, but there's a wonderful passage in the middle of her book in which she sort of captures the essence of what's going on here um, in a quite haunting and, and poignant way. And so I'll read you some of that in closing. She writes, all across the country there was misery and rejoicing. All across the country, what had happened whipped about by itself as if a live electric wire had snapped off a pylon in a storm and was whipping about in the air above the trees, the roofs, the traffic. All across the country, people felt it was the wrong thing. All across the country, people felt it was the right thing. All across the country, people felt they'd really lost. All across the country, people felt they'd really won. All across the country, people felt they'd done the right thing and other people had done the wrong thing. All across the country, people looked up on Google, what is the European Union? All across the country, people waved flags in the rain. All across the country, people drew swastika graffiti. All across the country, people threatened other people. All across the country, people told people to leave. All across the country, the media was insane. All across the country, politicians lied. All across the country, politicians fell apart. All across the country, politicians vanished. All across the country, promises vanished. And in closing, and I'm, I'm just quoting parts of this chapter, all across the country, the country split in pieces. All across the country, the countries cut adrift. All across the country, the country was divided. A fence here, a wall there, a line drawn here, a line crossed there. A line you don't cross here, a line you better not cross there. A line of beauty here, a line dance there, a line you don't even know exists here. A line you can't afford there, a whole new line of fire, line of battle, end of the line, here, there. Now there are some echoes in that, and if it sounds familiar, that's a play on Charles Dickens' tale of two cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And if there's other echoes, it's because we are also living in that world at the moment. And I think she's captured that really nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dewey. We actually have a few uh, online questions here, and then if anybody in the audience has a question, please flag me and I'll, I'll bring the microphone around. But uh, Susan Marquez from the class of 1967 asks, how do you think the British exit vote influenced the presidential vote in the United States? That's a really good question because the UKIP leader started turning up at Trump rallies and things like that, and Trump was invoking it, of course, as well. 
One of the ironies of all that was that um, Trump was making those statements in Scotland, which overwhelmingly voted uh, to remain a part, of the, uh, a part of the EU. But I guess that just says that golf courses are a different type of universes from the rest of the countries they happen to inhabit. Um, I think as a sort of media talking point and a sense that momentum was generating elsewhere, uh, that yes, it probably did help Trump. Um, the media were certainly making those comparisons. And uh, I think you know, it, it gave a sense that there's a bigger world out there that people like Steve Bannon are, are anxious to, to cultivate, uh, that there's a similar thing happening in Europe and that there are connections to be made. And we have uh, another question from Amy McNeil, class of uh, 1988. She asks, what do you think the possibilities are, the BRICS, that will result in Scottish independence? See, we're under the predictions thing, and historians aren't supposed to do that, or at least do it well. Um, I think there will be a referendum on this, and I think the Scots will probably vote to leave. Um, now, there's one other scenario out there that's bubbling around at the moment as a kind of third way, and this is being peddled by Gordon Brown. Um, if nothing else, the Scots are going to be in an enormously powerful negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the UK government. Um, and if someone can craft a solution that way that gets a lot of things Scotland might like, uh, we may see that, that headed off. But I, I don't know. Timing is going to be everything on this one. There's also another question lurking in the background here, and that is, um, how far does the EU want to be seen embracing separatist movements? Um, in other words, if, if, the e if the UK breaks up, um, the EU embraces Scotland, what does that mean for Basque separatists, or the Catalan people, or the Northern League in Italy? Um, I think there will probably be some wariness on the EU part um, as far as that goes. But on the other hand, we've had splits before. The Czech Republic and Slo Slovakia is one of them, and they are both members of the EU. But I think uh, the question is a good one because it really gets it to the extent to which the Scots really supported remaining, remaining part, of, um, part of the European Union. Um, and if I can get to the, the map here where I had this. Um, here we go. Whoops. Um, so the vote, you know, in Scotland, 62% of Scots wanted to remain. Um, all that yellow is the remain vote in Scotland. One of the other things to mention about this is the, uh, on the map, that yellow that's there um, is very much now Scottish Nationalist Party territory. That would have been the Labour Party once upon a time. But the Labour Party has melted down um, in Scotland, and that's been a massive advantage for the, for the Scottish Nationalists. Uh, yeah, we have a question in the audience here. With uh, Brexit, Trump, and the possible um, France exit and Italy exit as well, and the more conservative uprising in France and Germany, uh, what would you say that um, speaks towards with the unity of Europe in general and uh, tackling the immigrant crisis? Okay, that, that's actually a very, very good question. I think we have a tendency in this country to assume that Europe is this magically unified place, at least as far as the EU goes. And in fact, it's never really been that way, apart from some governments and, and the Franco-German relationship has been really important. But the EU is more unpopular in some parts of, of Europe than it actually is in, in Britain itself. Um, when the treaty was signed creating the European Union, so the Maastricht Treaty, it passed in France by, I don't know, Tineke, just six tenths of a percent, perhaps, something like that. It was a very, very close run thing. Um, so when I said this was more of a, 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 a perfect storm with gale force winds that had been blowing a long time, there's deep unpopularity in Europe about the European Union and its inability to deal with things like migration and international crises and things like that. The irony, of course, is that national governments are largely responsible for that because they won't give up enough sovereignty to actually come to plausible solutions to some of those problems. So it's you know, kind of a storm of its own making, I guess. But yeah, it would be a mistake to, to overestimate the popularity of the EU within, within Europe, Europe itself. Um, oh, another question in the audience here. 
Uh, what do you see over the next two years as being the major economic impact on England of mm. getting out? That's also a very, very good question. And if we had an economist here, you'd get a much better answer. Um, in some ways, because the pound dropped in value so quickly, that has actually cushioned some of the blow because it's been good for, good for exports. Um, the longer term is going to depend, I think, on, on what kind of terms Britain can get insofar as there's a, there's a trade deal. If the wall goes up, um, selling washing machines in Dusseldorf is going to get a lot, a lot harder for British manufacturers. Um, yeah, the jury is still very, uh, you know, you could find economists all over the place on, on that one as well. Um, I think the terms of the deal are going to, are going to set that. Um, but the British Treasury has made some pretty ominous noises about things being hard in, in the short term, they say. Um, we shall see. And uh, Ted from the class of 2000 asks, who are the main people that stay in the European, the European Union faction and the main people behind the Brexit movement? And what are their motives, economic and cultural? Um, so who are the main people in the Remain unit? So younger people, um, Londoners overwhelmingly, um, people who li lived in more cosmopolitan parts of the country who tend to be wealthier as well. Those who object will tend to be poorer, uh, coming from the north and eastern parts of the country in particular. They also tend to carry heavy um, personal debt loads as well. Um, housing prices in Britain are eye-watering compared to what we have in the United States. And, and owning home, a home is a, is a genuine luxury in the UK. Um, I can't get past the sort of older generation in this one either. When you saw the, the rallies for the UKIP people, it was not the masses of the unemployed who were there waving, you know, Union Jacks and things like that. It was older people. Many of them retired, already have pensions, but for whom this was a, this was a cultural question. Um, that the appearance of so many Polish plumbers and Romanian tech, uh, um, electricians and others just made them sense for whatever reason that their country wasn't theirs anymore. And there was enough within the EU or within the, among those who, who believe that Britain should be a part of the EU, they have not always played as honestly as perhaps they could have or should have. In particular, they've tended to tiptoe around the, so the whole sovereignty idea that you actually do have to give up sovereignty and indeed significant amounts of it to be a full-fledged member of the European Union. And they've never really quite owned up to that as well. Um, and so there was an argument to be made on that basis. And, and people made it, but they injected it with a lot of emotional stuff as well. And then there's the other piece of it, which is the national identity part. So if there's a British identity, an identifiable one that is said to exist, its formative moments were probably in the early 1800s, where it was about pro-empire, anti-France, anti-Catholic. Well, the empire's gone. France was no longer the great enemy by the time we got to the 20th century, which means that Europe as a whole becomes the sort of, the sort of obvious, obvious other, I guess. It's convenient. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of divisions and splits within this that, that makes it sort of hard to explain. But there are parallels of that in, in Trumpism, um, in Le Penism, in France, even back to the 1950s with Pujadism and things like that. So in other words, I think one of the reasons why these groups we're calling populist are successful is because there are established political parties that have already been making at least a part of the case that they are now capitalizing on. Besides for the um, economic issues that you already um, explained tonight, what, um, what um, personal or specific effects will Brexit have on London with the specific trade deals and economic um, differences that London gets compared to all of England? Um, there are people in the finance sector who will be deeply worried. Um, Frankfurt, among other places, is already trying to woo major international banks to come there. Europe is the largest trading bloc in the world. I mean, population-wise, it's 507 or 508 million people, I think. Britain goes out, so they're down 65 million. That's still a lot of people. 
Um, so the notion of you know import and export and the taxes that might apply to that are going to be at the heart of the heart of the negotiations that take place. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and I don't know how far this has actually happened, of, of corporations making plans to kind of pull up sticks and, and go to France or Germany or elsewhere. I, I'm not sure how much evidence there is of that thus far. The city of London's a pretty robust financial market, um, and it's not going to fade anytime soon. But there may be particular manufacturing sectors that, that could end up suffering quite badly. OK. Um. If we don't have any other questions here in the audience, I think that might bring us to a close for this evening. Uh, thank you, Professor Dewey, again for the the talk this evening. And uh, you know, I know we have a, a few members in LA that are going to be tuning in later tonight and watching it on demand once uh, once the time zone kind of hits around there. So uh, thank you again. Thank you very much.